Good evening. Hope I haven't kept you waiting too long. We're a little, things are sparse here in the house, but we're going at it anyway, so uh, we're glad you're here. Glad you're going to uh, be with us by Facebook Live tonight and uh, enjoy the stream. Make sure you drop a comment, leave your name, uh, you know, like, follow, share, whatever you want to do there, please do so. And, and uh, we uh, appreciate you allowing us into your living room tonight so or wherever it is you watch your, uh, the stream from. So anyway, um, we're going to be uh, looking at some stuff and getting involved in, uh, uh, we've got several things kind of colliding here as far as things to look at, but uh, I want to start tonight, and we'll call tonight's message, Making Ready. I believe that's what I called it. Uh, so anyway, I had about three things down, setting the stage. Let me look at my notes real quick here. Uh, setting the stage, uh, preparing the way, making ready. And I think I went with making ready. Uh, we're going to be talking. We've been talking about um, on Sunday mornings until this past Sunday. We were, uh, uh, we've been talking about the, the interaction of Christ with his disciples after the resurrection. And so we, you know, we've been talking about that. And so we're still kind of in that part, <clears throat> that portion uh, of the scripture and how that's playing out. Now, it's, it's hard to, for us to be surprised at how it plays out because we're looking back on it. But if you can try to imagine what it might have been like to not, to not know what the promise was, to not have a real idea of what the, what it meant uh, when John said, I indeed baptize you with water uh, under repentance, but there comes one after me who's mightier than I, who the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Uh, he it is who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And as we, as we covered in one of those earlier lessons on a Sunday morning, we, uh, we you know, uh, Jesus reintroduces them. He said, what John was talking about is now in your imminent future. It's now on, it's on the docket. It's that promise is, is going to be manifest. That, do, that promise is going to come into reality. What John prophesied is fixing to come to pass. So, and I wanted to reach back. If you remember earlier, uh, when we started the year, we spent a lot of time talking about preparation. We spent a lot of time about being ready and and having hearts prepared and having a, a readiness, a state of mind, uh, a, a state of being where we are, where there's vigilance, where we're sober and vigilant. And being sober and vigilant doesn't mean you can't have fun and you can't be relaxed to some degree. It just means that you don't let your guard down all the way, that you're, you're still always prepared, right? You're always at the ready for whatever, however the Holy Spirit wants to move, whatever the word is, is being released into your life to move forward and to move uh, toward God. And so um, I want to start uh, this evening. I want to reach back a little further, and I want to go to Luke 22 and 10. Uh, because I think that uh, I, I can't say this with a, a absolute, I can't show you this with absolute biblical certainty, without remove all doubt for you, uh, but I believe with all of my heart that the place they are waiting for the promise is the place they entered into to celebrate Passover, okay? I believe it's the same room. I believe it's the same place. And so... So what I want to do tonight is look at Luke 22 and verse 10, 10 through 12. And as we look at that, we look at it and when we, when we read it in, in context, we read it in relationship to the Last Supper. We read it in relationship to the, to the Passover and the Seder. And that's, and that's fine. That's, that's certainly not incorrect. But what if Jesus knew they were going to be staying there until Pentecost? And perhaps when he says these things, he's speaking not just about 
being ready for Passover, being ready for uh, the Seder and the Passover meal. But what if it's what if he's saying that there's a readiness and a preparation that's that's taken place that's going to carry you through until the promise becomes a reality? Okay, and I just want you to consider that that might be that that might have some small. Uh, part of what we're going to read here. And he said, and he said unto them, verse 10, Luke 22 and verse 10, this is also, you'll find this also, I think, in Mark 14, uh, verses 12 through 15, I think. And so I'm not going to read that one tonight, but because Luke uh, authored the book of Acts, and we're going to go from Luke into Acts chapter 1, I figured I would just go ahead and stay with one author tonight. So anyway, and he said unto them, Jesus is sending them to, uh, to, to prepare for Passover, right? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And you shall say, I'm in verse 11, unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber? where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. Verse 12, And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There, make ready. And so we, we, know, that, we know that there's a lot of preparation that's involved in getting ready to, uh, you know, for, the, for Passover and for the Seder. There's a lot of stuff with the Feast of Unleavened Bread that has to be, they remove all the leaven, make sure there's none of that stuff in the, in the dwelling. Uh, and so they had this this room that they were allowed to use, and but when Jesus says, and uh, you know, he was going to show you a large upper room. It's furnished. It's got everything in it that we need. So that's the provision of God. Everything that you need is going to meet you here. And now you just need to make ready. You need to get. You need to be ready. You need to make yourself ready. You need to do the things that that you're required to do to be ready for this moment. But they were going to come back to this room after, uh, after Jesus is arrested in the garden, after they fled, after they're so upside down in their uh, uncertainty, doubt. Evidently, there's been a glitch in the matrix, and uh, we have... Uh, we're back doing the live stream. So we're in Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 12. We started out in Luke 22. Uh, apologies for that. Evidently, we had some kind of snafu with either the router or something. So uh, I don't know. I just, it tells me stuff on the screen. And then, you know. Anyway, we're going to try to get this started again. So uh, we're in Acts chapter, chapter 1. Uh, I can restart verse, verse 12. And reread that just for sake of continuity. So, uh, but we're talking about making ready, being you know, being being prepared and, and being made ready. And so they, Christ has ascended, and then they returned. Verse twelve. Then returned they unto Jerusalem, unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and, and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. So I believe they went back to the upper room where they had shared the la what we call the Last Supper. I believe they went back there. I believe that's where Jesus appeared to them, showed up suddenly in the room. I believe that's where they, you know, the, 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 initial, the initial prophetic element to what Jesus said to them was go into the city, you're going to find a man bearing a pitcher of water which in and of itself is rare because most of the time women carry the water in the first century. And so this guy was not shouldn't be too hard to find in a city full of people coming in for a pilgrim feast that that to see a man carrying a pitcher of water, find him, follow him. It's like God uh, you know kind of put a highlighter mark on somebody and then 
and, and let them let them follow the trail, right? And so they got permission uh, for a, a, a place to have their Seder to celebrate Passover. It was there that the disciples returned to that place after Christ was arrested in the garden, after he was taken and tried, after he was crucified. They came back there. They were in and out of there. It was their base in Jerusalem. It's where they were. And so this is about what's being furnished and what's being made ready. I believe Jesus was speaking prophetically that God's provision was for them and that that place was going to hold a special, a special meaning for them, that they would come back to it. And I, whether it was just to revisit or kind of hold on to what they had known best and first, that's probably part of it, I would imagine. That's, that would be very human of them and very, uh, you know, we... It's hard for us to part with things and to change things suddenly uh, upon the kind of uh, trauma that they've been through. Uh, but, but they came back there and they, they were trying to hold together. And so uh, after Jesus appears to them with many infallible proofs and he shows himself alive after his death uh, and after his resurrection, he shows himself alive. And so they go back there and so the, the, there's not as many haunting memories in the room. I want to say it to you that way. It's not, it's, they've, I think they've started to step past what might have been or what they thought was going to be and come to terms with what is. And so this is very, it's, it's a very critical juncture or junction of faith for us when we make the determination to go ahead and move forward, regardless of. Uh, of the disappointment, regardless of of how it, different it might be as opposed to what we envisioned it and thought it to be, uh, then you know that that's a very a very important thing for uh, you know for for us to hold together. And they were being held together. It says that they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. And so I want to take a few minutes and talk about this and. And I think oftentimes we, we use this phrase, and uh, excuse me, we use this phrase in one accord, and we use it like it's the great key to them being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm not saying it's not important. Jesus gave the promise. The promise was going to come. What, what they're doing is they are being made ready. There is a there is a preparation that is happening in their hearts. They are they they have a a purpose. They have the purpose of a promise that is set before them. And Jesus says, "Tarry in Jerusalem. Wait, tarry there until you be endued with power from on high. You need to hang there until the promise you receive it." Well, we don't know what the promise looks like. We don't know what it sounds like, smells like. We don't know what it's supposed to be. And yet when it shows up, it's going to be unmistakable for them, right? It's going to be something that they couldn't miss. It's going to be something so powerful and so clear and so, uh, and so uh, uh, wonderful for them that it's going, to, it's going to move them. It's going to move them with leaps and bounds into and toward the future, and it's going to unlock everything for them. It's going to break down some of their pre-existing barriers. It's going to cause them to start to see the word in a, in a relevant state of fulfillment. Okay? That's a powerful thing because the, 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 uh, the Jewish people were very, very committed to what's going to happen. And, and, and they weren't, uh, it was always out there. It was elusive. It was, uh, you know, undefined and, and out in the future somewhere. And they were not, you know, just they got to dream a lot about it and imagine it and think about how it could have been and what, how it's going to be. And so they had a lot of these uh, grandiose ideas that kind of kept them from seeing the real thing, if I can say it to you that way. Because what Jesus did was very grand in itself. But because they were looking for something bigger, something uh, with more, dare I say, pizzazz, 
Uh, you know, they were looking for something with more glitter, more more shine, more uh, more gold, and, and and less Roman involvement because they were looking at, for a particular in a you know in a particular way. They looked past what they were seeing. They looked past what he was presenting to them, and he presented to them the very best life they could possibly have. The very the, the greatest life you could possibly know. In relationship to God, Jesus came and modeled that. He walked that. He, he showed that. He put that on display. And they're still looking for something other than that. And because we start to lock into some of these things, we kind of miss what's happening right in real time. And so the disciples began to, to find this. And to be in one accord means that they started to have a singleness of purpose. They, they were coming together with this idea of a promise, right? And they were coming together with what Jesus said about the promise and about, about what it meant and about uh, the power it was going to give them and not necessarily just so they could uh, lord it over people, but it was, going, it was going to give them the kind of power to communicate, the power to speak life, to to uh, project life, to bring life to the world in its in a real sense, in a in a measurable manner, right? They were gonna they were gonna be able to do stuff that that uh, that you know a lot of folks think we're not capable to do anymore, and I don't know exactly why that is, but but this is the first time it says they were in one accord in one place, right? They, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, not necessarily in one place, but they'll talk about that later in, in Acts 2. But ten times in the book of Acts, ten times, the phrase, uh, you know, one accord occurs in the book of Acts. And see, that's that says something, okay? That says that there was a, a togetherness, a... a I don't mean they all looked alike and believed everything identically and dressed alike, smelled alike, and all that kind of stuff. Because that's what we think unity is sometimes, is we think it's everybody doing the same thing at the same time. But what they had was they had this marvelous singleness of purpose. This, this We're here until the promise comes. And because they were they were together in that same spirit, that same demeanor, mindset, uh, you know, however you want to say that, uh, uh, you know, frame of frame of mind or manner of thinking, you could even perhaps even use some of those things. Because they were in that state of being, they were ready. There was a, this was the readiness that I believe Jesus was speaking to them about, even in Luke twenty two. This is part of it. It may not have been, it, he was talking about being ready for this, but he's now he's told them to be ready for something else. And in the same space that they could look back with nostalgia, they were going to be filled in a way that was going to open the future broadly for them. It was, gonna, it was going to give them greater purpose greater uh, uh, zeal. It was going to move them forward in such a powerful way that they were, that, that, that they, I'm sure when Jesus was arrested and he was gone for those three days, those three dark days, they probably thought there was no purpose. There was no plan. They sure didn't understand it. And everything was just too dark. It was over. They, they'd missed it. They'd messed up. And now they were going to be just retooled, if you will. They were going to be reconfigured, if I can use a technological term there. They were going to be updated and upgraded, and they were going to be a, a, introduced to a brand new program that was going to carry them forward in such a fashion that the world was never going to be the same. And that's incredible. And that's, a, that's what, a, what a marvelous thing to, uh, to consider and to think about. Uh, you know, so this state never leaves them, all right? What I'm after with the fact that just kind of the trivia point, so to speak, if you can call it that, that this phrase happens 10 times in, in the book of Acts, it says that they were able to maintain that. And you know they had, they had 
disruptions. They had differences. They had problems to solve. They had things that they had to do uh, and, and figure out. But they, they were able to, to maintain and recapture. If they lost it for a short period, they were able to come back to it and get recalibrated. And so they were able to find their way forward and, and, and stay true to what God had said was available to them, okay? So they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. And so they were, they were praying. They spent time, you know, a time of consecration, a time of, of uh, introspection. However you want to say that. You could even use the word meditate if you want to or meditation because it's, you know, I mean, in, in the modern world, meditation has become some, uh, you know, some Eastern idea. But, you know, the, the psalmist said, let the, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my Prince and my Redeemer. So, so meditation is something that's been, that's been around for a long time and it's, you know, uh, it, it's just a, it's a it's a form of discipline where you abide and you are able to stay and focus and center your thoughts and your heart and your spirit on what God's purpose and lo- and and plan is for your life. And I believe that that's what they were doing. And their purpose was to receive the promise. At this point, their purpose was to to be prepared to receive, so that they could, so that in the res- reception of the promise they would be prepared to dispense the gospel and the life of Jesus to the world and so they are uh, you know they're 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 gathered and they're connected and they're pulling together this is so so this speaks so profoundly to me of how how they had that you know they've been kind of pulled apart and you know, from the from from the the supper where they were looking at each other differently through the eyes of of who's the betrayer. So when you start to look at your brothers and sisters with the eyes that that they could be the betrayer, then you're not exactly pulling into a connection of peace and harmony, right? You are you're looking at them more with suspicion and and uncertainty than with anything else, and so. Uh, you know, but they so so this speaks greatly of a of a healing in their ranks that got ferreted out, that got revealed, and it wasn't them. And the, even though they all had failed and 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 had some sense of betrayal, uh, I believe they all had to deal with some sense of betrayal in their own heart. Whether whether you know maybe not to the degree that Judas did, but but you know Peter's denial. I mean, I'm sure he felt like he betrayed his savior. Everybody that ran off felt like they didn't stand the test and didn't keep the didn't keep the faith, right? So there they there was a sense of betrayal in that there had to be in my estimation there had to be for them to for for them to even come back together it was a it was a a, a, um, a, a trip, a journey to try to find solace, to try to find healing, to try to find something that would help them, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a salve, a balm, something to help them feel better and soothe the pain of their own fear and their own uh, rejection and their own denial and all of those things. They were, uh, you know, that, that was what they were dealing with. And that's why he appeared to them for 40 days. And so they're in the last 10-day stretch of this, but now look at how they're functioning. Look at how they're, they're, they're pulling together and they're, they're reconsecrating themselves. They're, 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 they have singleness of purpose and they're, they're holding together with, with, uh, with wisdom and with, with, uh, with uh, uh, just this kind of, uh, of meaning and design that is, that, that is healing in and of itself. And uh, and so, while they are in one accord and they are continuing uh, to uh, find their commonality and find themselves in prayer and supplication, and and there's more here than just the twelve, and that's that's one of the things I think that gets lost on us is there's so many people that walked with them that were unnamed. 
so many that made the trips and followed them around that were that you know you hear about the the main 12 and then you hear about the the, the women and you hear uh, you know but you don't hear about them often and you so it, it sounds like from if you were a, if you were a critic you would think well you know Jesus had what 16 18 people with him and followed him around but there was a lot more than that. It was uh, there was actually 120 people in this room at this point, and that's uh, so it must have been a pretty good size room. But you have to understand they were also very comfortable in the first century of packing a lot of people in one place. You have to don't have to go back any further than the paralyzed man. They couldn't get him in. They had to tear the roof off. Right? Why? Because there wasn't room for him in the house. There wasn't room to get him in there. There was no way to pass in. Fire marshal would have lost his mind in the, in the modern world. Uh, you know, we'd have had you, you know there it would have been a problem. That level of that level of crowd in a, such a confined space. Anyway, verse thir- verse fifteen. Excuse me. Says and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. So this, you know, this this prayer that Jesus prayed for him. We talked about that where he said. You know, Satan's desired to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. That your faith doesn't fail you. And when you're converted, when you get it turned around, I prayed for you to get it turned around. And sometimes getting it turned around ain't pretty. Sometimes getting it turned around is not glorious in the, the, in the process of getting turned around. In fact, it's downright humiliating. You know, it's been known to be very uh, more than humbling. It's been downright humiliating to some degree. Uh, but, but getting it turned around is the main thing. And Peter had so he had so recovered his 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 not just his zeal but his heart. Because see, when when you have the kind of when you have the kind of denial that he did when he had failed so spectacularly, at least in his own mind. Jesus foretold it. God wasn't the least bit surprised that Peter did what he did. In fact, he told him he was going to. He tried to soften the blow, right? He said, you know, you say you're going to follow me, but I'm I'm telling you before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. But I prayed for you. You know, I've, I've, I've held you up. I've seen, I see this coming, but I've prayed for you. And so the prayer of Christ is, you can see the turning around of, of the Apostle Peter here. He's not the guy that, that needs to be encouraged to feed his lambs and feed his sheep, right? He's, he's, he's kind of uh, moved through that particular stage. His confidence has been restored. He's, he's now clearly the primary voice in the group and so he he stands up in the midst of the disciples and he said the number of names together were about 120 that's why I see when we listed them earlier there was just 11 names in there right so so with there being 120 people in there Peter stands up and he says men and brethren I'm in verse 16 the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. So what is happening here is that Peter is starting to connect some scripture. He's starting to see that what David had said earlier in the Psalms, what David had brought out was... was uh, was relevant to where they were. And so it's like, uh, um, you know, he's, he stands up and he says, we've got, we have an office to fill. He took 12 of us, and of course, as Jesus said in a couple of places in, in the Gospels, I have not I chose, chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it was clear that one was going to fail. And so now, but they were going to step forward. And Peter says, Wait a minute, the scripture talks about this. And so what's happening is is that the word's becoming alive in him, right? He's starting to see it and it's starting to to, uh, manifest itself where there's an understanding that is starting to rise up in him. And that's what I mean about a word of, uh, uh, in 
of relevance. It's not just something for the future. It's not just something about the past. Because we can take this book and we can talk about the past with it, and that's wonderful. We can do that. Or we can take this book and we try to push everything into the future. And we can do that too. And that, that's that's all well and good. But at some point, we have to be able, to, how does it help me today? What is relevant today? What ministers to me now? How does the life of this word and this book affect my life today? And so Peter was finding the today element. Jesus, I believe, walked in that. That's why when he read uh, Isaiah 66 out of uh, out of the scroll in his hometown synagogue, and he rolled the scroll together, and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He was saying, you guys have this pushed into the future, but I'm telling you it's now. I'm telling you it's today. I'm telling you it's relevant now. And so this becomes, this, it, that to me was his was one of his greatest attributes as a teacher was his ability to take the word and bring it into relevance in the moment and bring it into our our life and how we live and how we how we are designed to live and to exist and know and function in the world. See, that's a whole lot different than trying to get people. I'm, I'm going to get. I'm going to probably mess with folks here for just a minute. So I'm going to try not to do it for too long, but do it, I, I, I will. Uh, that's why most of what we do in, in the Christian community this, these days is to, we take the past, what Jesus did for us, and we bring it to the moment, which is a good thing to do, and then we let you set in that moment because of what's going to happen in the future. And so in the meantime, what do we do today? What are we doing now? If we've got, if everything's about, you know, I mean, we, you know, you get them, if everything's about going to heaven, and I believe in going to heaven, but if everything's about that, then we, we want to get this over with. We don't care what this looks like. And folks, I'm going to shoot straight with you. This is one of the reasons why the world's in the shape it's in is because we've had that mindset and we have allowed that to, we have fostered it and it has festered in the world. And so, uh, you know, that's just something that, that I believe we need to sit down and take another look at for in, in some capacity because it's, it has robbed believers of the kind of life and lifestyle that Jesus came to bring. And I'm not saying that, that you have nothing to look forward to. Please don't misunderstand me. I believe in heaven. I believe in heaven after you die. I believe, but I believe in an abundant life now. I believe in a heavenly life today. I believe that eternal life is relevant today. It's his life. It's endless. And I don't believe trying to engage it now is going to take away from what of, all that still remains of it out there because it's endless. It's limitless. It's without measure. It is, it, it's greater than we can imagine. And so... I'm going to move on from meddling now. Anyway, that to me, though, is what is what Peter's doing. He's saying, okay, the scripture talks about this, and let's bring it into how, it, how we function today. And so he said David was talking about this stuff, and he said, for verse 17, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. And then he says in verse 18, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. So he gets a little graphic there, and uh, and kind of uh, you know gets into the the horrible way and manner in which Judas ended up because of his betrayal. But his emphasis is not so much on how Judas died. He kind of mentions it, I believe, kind of matter of factly and in passing. What he's after is we need to fill a position. We have, we, we were called 12 and we are 11 and we need to step in. We need to bring somebody, but who, how do we qualify them? Okay. Okay. So what he does here is he says, uh, you know, that, uh, it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch that a field is called in their proper tongue, a keldama, that is to say the field of blood. 
For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric or his office let another take. So uh, that so he's taking that psalm and he is bringing it into relevance. And he said, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So first requirement is that you need to have been here from jump. From the time Jesus started coming in, going out and 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 interacting with us and you may not have been you you were a follower you may not have been tapped on the shoulder uh, and and called by name in that sense but you followed because your heart was was gripped by his message by his life by everything about him the I'm going to call it the charisma of Christ and when we think of charisma we think of uh, we think of personality alone that people are drawn to but remember Charisma or charis is the Greek word for grace. And so, so what I'm after here is, is that the grace of Christ drew men unto him, whether they felt specifically called to function as a disciple or not. They came to be part and parcel of that. They came to hang around the edges of it. They came to be, to be as close to it as they could get. Right, and so they're they're trying not necessarily to force their way in. They just want to see. I mean, think about it. They've been waiting their lifetime. In fact, their ancestors waited their lifetime to see. That's why Jesus said, "You know, blessed are your eyes and your ears, for many righteous men have longed to hear and see what you hear and see." You know, you're blessed because. Men have died in faith waiting for this hour and this moment, and you're in the middle of it. So, so think about that and re- remember and don't forget how blessed you are to be part of what this is, of what God's doing in his son. That's just, a, that's just, a, just so, so powerful to me that, see, you know, we, we think that, you know, that, some of us have maybe a, a difficult time kind of being on the on the edge or on the side, but but think of your you've got a ringside seat to what God's doing. It doesn't mean and and you get affected by that. And these folks were, you know, they had been so captivated by His grace, so affected by His love and His power and His ability to connect with people and open the scripture and open the world to them right he i mean he changed the world for people one one soul at a time whether you were a leper alongside the road or a blind man begging for your uh, you know begging for all of your lifetime born blind and you that was your life you were a beggar you were you were relegated to a status of, uh, of, of a lower status, we'll say. And Jesus changed the world of that man and that family, and it rocked everybody else's world because his grace and his love and his compassion was so powerful that it moved this individual from a low place to a prominent place. This man got to speak to people who wouldn't speak to him. They might throw they might throw a denarii at him or a, a or something like that, and he was not allowed in the temple. He was not allowed, uh, you know. He was not allowed on temple grounds. He was not allowed to come in because all of these folks were disqualified because they were unclean. They were not whole. They had they had physical flaws that prevented them from being part of what what was happening in the temple. And everybody knows that's the only place God works in Judaism. What Jesus did was he brought the fatherhood of God outside the walls and released it into the world, and it changed everything. And he showed then that our bodies, our lives are now temples. Our lives are now the sanctuary that Jesus will live in and will move in and have his being in. Anyway, so he he says... uh, 
that uh, of all these which have accompanied us, I'm in verse 21 again, uh, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John. So he reaches all the way back to when Jesus was baptized by John. So this is not this is not just the old, uh, John, uh, how do I say this? Yeah, I'll do it this way. Johan come lately, okay? This was this was some this was folks that had been followed. They were unheralded. Uh, we don't we have no idea who they were. Right. We even don't think of them as being part of the equation or part of the ministry team. And you say, well, they weren't. They weren't part of the disciples. Who's to say that they didn't help get people organized, that they weren't there to serve the apostles when they needed to hand out baskets or they needed to get people organized in groups and set them in the grass or they needed to, to, uh, to do some of those kind of things or set a stage, if you will, for the Sermon on the Mount or to, to prepare a place or to do any of those kind of things. Who's to say that they weren't somehow connected and used in that in those capacities and in those in the in, in that manner to be able to uh, help everything come off more smoothly and and better than it would without the extra hands. There's always the hands that are unheralded, and that's the, the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of uh, of Christ is is that He knew every one of them, and and. They may not have been part of the 12, but they were part of what he was doing. Okay, and so beginning from the baptism of John under the same day that he was taken up from us. So, I mean, that's, that's all the way, right? I mean, that's from start to finish just about as far as that goes. Some of them, let me say it this way. See, Peter himself and James and John were not necessarily at the Jordan River when Christ was baptized. They were fishing. He went to Galilee and found them, right? Some of these folks had been with it longer than longer than some of the some of the big names here. Okay? At least we'll, we'll just use it. The, the guy speaking was he was one of the early disciples, I know, but he wasn't he wasn't at the at the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized and John pointed him out. He didn't know who he was until he showed up and said, hey, take me out in your boat a little bit. I need to speak to these folks. And then once he did, he says, let's, let's launch out into the deep and catch some fish. And Peter said, you know, I've already, I've been here, done that all night and haven't caught, haven't had anything. No zero success, less than one. And he said, nevertheless, at your word, I let down my net. And when he did, he caught it. They pulled in a net that I almost broke and had to get James and John came over and joined the, and they were able to, to land the catch between two boats on the shore. And Peter goes and falls down at his, at Jesus's feet and says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, from now on, you're going to catch me and follow me. Right. And so, so, so in some sense, these guys had predated some of those very disciples. And must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? So they needed the twelfth witness, right, for the propriety of the of of the word. Okay, uh, and so there were twelve sons of of Jacob, and there were going to be twelve disciples of Christ. Okay, you were going to have that was going to be a part of it, and they appointed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, I'm in verse 23, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. You'd think the guy with the most names would be best known. Okay? And what they did was they, they <clears throat> now listen, there's a, there's a, I've been around people who have debated this and they've, they've looked at some of this and they, they have op expressed an opinion that, that they missed God in doing this. Yeah. That they should have waited, and Paul should have been the twelfth apostle. Uh, and and I, you know, I'm not going. I'm not going to fuss with you too bad over that. I mean, you're entitled to your opinion. 
you know, so I'll, I'll leave that there. But, but I believe they were being directed and moved upon. And I believe that what they did was what they knew to do, okay? And it was something that was a, an established method of choice, yeah. casting lots. Yeah. And so it was something that was a longstanding Jewish custom, and these boys were Jewish to the bone. And so they, you know, they were, they, they did this and, and I think we just have to roll with it because it's what the, the word says. And, uh, you know, the, some of those same folks believe Paul shouldn't have appealed to Caesar and he could have been free and how much more he could have done. And, you know, but he wasn't about, pa Paul did plenty. Paul got plenty done, but his purpose and his greater purpose was to stand before princes and kings and great people, people that the rest of the disciples would never get an audience to. Yeah. Wow. And so, and it's not, you know, I mean, because God loves those folks also, right? Uh, anyway, it says, and they prayed and said, thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether which of these two thou hast chosen that they may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And so, so they go into this. They've not received the promise yet, but they feel like a whole unit. They're not missing a tooth. They're not, you know, their smile isn't missing a tooth. They're, you know, they're, they're not, they, they don't feel shorthanded. Uh, they, they have, Peter has stood up, and, and I believe with, uh, with the, the blessing of God, he stood up and he has communicated, and, 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 and because he drew the scripture into it to explain himself and to show the way forward, I believe everybody there kind of said, yeah, well, this is what we should do. I believe there was consensus. Uh, and, and I believe that that's consensus is a another one of those powerful things that belongs uh, to Judaism. It's a uh, it's it's an incredible thing. I won't get into that tonight. But but, but um, he is uh, you know they cast lots and the lot falls on Matthias. And so again, part of the argument is is well you never read about anything Matthias did. So, you know, he was kind of a, just kind of a, a, a somebody that, you know, we don't read what Thomas did either. Right. There's a, most of the 12. If, if you're not talking about Peter, James and John, uh, and Matthew, Matthew wrote a gospel. But other than that, we don't have any idea what he did. Right. Okay. And, you know, and so you know, we know what John did. But, you know, you get into, once you get out into... Uh, you know Simon Zelotes and and, and Philip and uh, you know and, and all of these the other disciples. You don't have we don't have a record. Now you can say, well, we got some history for that, and fair enough, you got some uh, and some tradition, some church tradition for those things, and and it's better than nothing. But it still doesn't it doesn't speak to the it, it, the story of their ministry and their accomplishments are not something we have at our fingertips is what I'm after. So I don't think based on that we can simply we can simply uh, tell Matthias to scoot out the door. We don't have you know we don't we don't have anything for him. Uh, it, but they are making ready and see what they're doing is they're they are making themselves ready for the promise as best they know how. As much as they, as much as, you know, these folks were praying, they were, they were uh, it, it, of the same spirit, of the same singleness of purpose. They had this first and foremost, and they felt now they are ready, okay? They are making themselves ready to receive the fullness of what Christ has promised, of what John foretold that Jesus would do. And so they are the stages set. They have all the pieces are in place. Every chair is has 
of the 12 thrones, let me say it to you this way, of the 12 thrones that the apostles are going to judge Israel on, they have an apostle in every throne at this point, okay? And you say, well, you know, that's, that's a bit of a stretch. Well, you know, perhaps, but it, it's, uh, it's, they spoke with authority into their own nation, and they corrected, and they ruled, and they, they ministered, and they stood in the stead of Christ to bring their brothers and sisters to life. And I believe that's a, that's, that's a kingdom operation. And from where I'm sitting, that's being enthroned with Jesus. He that overcometh, yes. Jesus says, will I grant to sit with me in my throne mm -hmm. as I overcame and sat with my father in his throne. But see, the throne's not made for just one. It's made for when you become one okay, with Christ, and you become one with the purpose and life of God, then, then you and I have, the, have the, uh, the ability to be seated in heavenly places. And to be seated in heavenly places means that we are enthroned with him. We're seated with him. Whereas if we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, uh, where is he seated? He's not in a folding chair beside the throne. He's not in a secondary position. He is seated in the throne because the Father and Son are together and one in the throne. And now when you and I come into that kind of union and that kind of relationship and that kind of spirit of life and grace, then you and I can be seated with him there. And he's not going to pull a folding chair up for you and me. He's going to seat us with him in heavenly places. And so what I'm looking at here is a group of people who are now all in. And they are not just not anxious in the sense of they have anxiety, but they're excited. They are ready. They're uh, optimistic. Think about that. These guys were far from optimistic less than 40 days ago they were far from optimistic in fact you could you could probably have started the pessimist club out of that group and and selected all the officers you needed from that group okay and they were you know i mean they they simply they were stunned they were shell shocked they were unprepared for what they for what they went through they didn't believe it. They couldn't have conceived it or believed it possible for, for things to turn out like they did. And now they're seeing life beyond that. I want to tell you, when you can find life beyond your disappointment and what you did, you had no idea that, that, that it could get like this and you find life beyond that, I'm telling you, it is, it is a glorious moment and a moment where the sun's never shone brighter. It is. There's a warmth to it that you thought you'd lost. There is a there is a a, a beauty to the world that you may have that, that that you couldn't see for all of the dismay and the and the disquietedness and the pain and the and and all that you've been through, whatever that might be. And so to see that happen is to watch the world change for people. These folks were ready to receive. Everybody was ready to receive. They were, they were waiting now and wholly waiting. That's holy with a W in front of it and two L's in the middle of it, I think. So they were, they were together and they were connected. And just what a shift. What the presence of Jesus does in our life is you know it'll make you shout it'll it'll it, it will it won't hurt your feelings it'll make you it, it will lift you up it will it will bring joy it will bring peace he will bring rest to your soul and when that starts to happen when that starts to work in you then you are starting to see the effect of his salvation and you are finding life 
greater than death. You're finding, you're experiencing a resurrection. In a, in a manner of speaking, that's what you're experiencing in that moment. And so to be raised up with him, to be raised with him, and to be seated with him is a marvelous place to be. And so Sunday morning we will get to the promise. So uh, I know it's not quite, it's kind of a Pentecost Sunday uh, week ahead of time, but I've got some stuff for Memorial Day that I want to get to. So <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Sorry about the hitch. Uh, earlier, it seems to have worked its own bugs out, so we're glad. Uh, thank you, bless you, and we enjoyed. I hope uh, that you were blessed with the word tonight. God bless. <laughs>